I'm going to assume at this point that you are aware of the stability issues Intel and its board partners have run into with some 13th and 14th gen processors, primarily the Core i9 13900K and 14900K. Now the simplest explanation that I can provide is this. Intel doesn't clearly communicate to their partners what the default operating specifications are for their CPUs and instead provide a series of guidelines. But even then, those are just guidelines and in reality, board makers have been free to really do whatever they want and do whatever they want they have. But before we get into that, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Ugreen and their new Nexode X 160 watt charger. Their most advanced solution yet featuring electronic stacking technology, enabling a more compact design that's both lighter and more powerful. In fact, it's 21% smaller than their original 140 watt USB-C version. With four ports, it provides fast charging via a trio of USB Type-C ports and a single Type-A port for a combined output of 160 watts, allowing you to fast charge your laptop, mobile phone, and tablet at the same time. It also includes fast charging for MacBooks with the PD 3.1 protocol, allowing a single USB-C port to pump out 140 watts. And with Thermal Guard Protection System 2.0, it protects your devices from short circuit, over voltage, over temperature, and over current. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so unlike AMD, Intel doesn't certify their motherboards, despite having their logo slapped on the box. And with no enforced specifications, whether that be to power limits or even safety settings, the entire platform has become a bit of a mess. Now, we recently spoke with some of Intel's partners, which gave us some pretty great insight into these issues. And a number of the engineers that we spoke to were all too happy to spill the beans. So if you did miss that content, do go check it out. We've started to get a pretty good idea of what's going on here and how Intel plans on tackling it or really doesn't plan on tackling it. They seem to just be wanting to shift the blame. But in any case, we've started to see a number of BIOS updates rolled out to update LJ 1700 motherboards to make them now in the spec, though Intel did promise that this mess would be fully addressed by the end of May, and that never really happened. That said, we have at least got some clarification of what the board partners will be implementing moving forward. It seems as though the Core i9 parts, such as the 13900K and 14900K, will run at 253 watts for PL1 and PL2, despite some Z790 motherboards currently using the Intel performance profile by default with their latest beta BIOS revisions. The performance profile will reduce the long duration power limit to just 125 watts, which isn't great, and it does result in around a 15% performance decline for core heavy workloads when compared to what we see at 253 watts. Now, Intel has communicated to board partners that setting PL1 to 125 watts is what they call standard while 253 watts is recommended. Initially, MSI went with 125 watts for their default profile, and in fact, at the time of filming this, that is still the case, but they do tell me they will be opting for the recommended 253 watt profile in a future BIOS update. So months later, we finally have some power profiles from Intel, though it's not entirely clear how they will be implemented yet. As we said, MSI is walking back their current implementation. But in spite of that, I have decided to benchmark the gaming performance of both the performance and extreme profiles using the Core i9 14900K, and I'll be comparing that data to the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D. So regardless of what configuration motherboard manufacturers ultimately go with, you will have the results for both of Intel's profiles. Now, about a month ago, I did a similar thing, but at the time it was unclear what was going to happen. We didn't test the performance profile as that wasn't yet a thing, Basically, we still need to hear from Intel, but a lot of you guys wanted to know how the updated profiles would affect performance, and back then it was called a baseline profile. Anyway, we did that testing and it is now outdated. Still, most of the information in that video was accurate, and it was certainly accurate at the time, but with official information now having come out of Intel, I didn't want to risk confusing viewers with that now outdated video, so I have deleted it since it was getting around 5,000 views per day still, which is very good. This updated version though, well, this should be it. Regardless of how LJ1700 boards end up being configured, they will use either Intel's performance or Extreme Profile. For testing, I'm using the MSI MPG Z790 Carbon Wi-Fi motherboard with BIOS version 7D89V1C2, and the Core i9-14900K will be paired with DDR5-7200 cell 34 memory. 
The Ryzen 7 7800X3D has been paired with 32GB of DDR5 6000 cell 30 memory. Now the reason we've gone with faster memory for Intel is because all LJ1700 CPUs that we've tested appear to work perfectly using 7200 memory, while AM5 processors are limited to DDR5 6000 for optimal performance, as this allows for a one-to-one -one ratio with the memory controller and DRAM. And AMD themselves claim that this is the sweet spot for Zen 4 processors. Finally, in total, I've tested 24 games using the RTX 4090 at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, and we'll go over the individual data for about half a dozen of the games tested before getting into the big breakdown graphs. Okay, let's get into it. We'll start by looking at the Assassin's Creed Mirage results, and here we see when using the extreme profile, so 253 watts, that the 14900K is just 4% slower than the 7800X3D, or 8% slower when looking at the 1% lows. Then when using the performance profile, the average frame rate of the 14900K drops by a further 4%, but it's the 1% lows that suffer the biggest hit, dropping by 10%. And this means the 7800X3 is now on average 8% faster than the power limited 14900K using the performance profile, and up to 20% faster when comparing those 1% lows. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077, we find that the 7800X3 d is 8% faster than the 14900K using the extreme profile, and 15% faster when limiting the Intel processor to the performance profile. That means we're seeing around a 5% reduction in performance for the i9 when using the performance profile. Next up we have Homeworld 3, and here the 7800X3D leads the 14900K by an 8% margin, or 15% if we limit the i9 to the performance profile. And that means there's a reasonable 7% uplift from the performance to extreme profiles for the 14900K. Counter-Strike 2 isn't a core heavy title, so the power profiles here don't really make much difference, Running the 14900K using either the performance or extreme modes yields the same result, or near enough to the same. And that means that the 7800X3D was around 12 to 15% faster here. Now, one of the newest games added to our list is Senua's Saga Hellblade 2, though this isn't a game that really tests top tier CPUs, and as a result, the 7800X3D and 14900K were very comparable. The performance profile did drop the 14900K down just below the 7800X3D, but we're only talking about a 5% reduction here. Horizon Forbidden West is another game that isn't particularly CPU demanding, at least not with flagship gaming processors. The 7800X3D was just 5% faster than the 14900K, or 6% faster if you limit the Core i9 to the performance profile. So overall, a very similar performance between these two CPUs, regardless of the power configuration. Next up, we have a Plague Tale Requiem, and this one is easily won by the 7800X3D, delivering up to 14% greater performance at 1080p. We also have another example where the performance profile doesn't hurt the frame rate all that much, just a 2% hit to the averages. Hogwarts Legacy is another game that the 7800X3D performs very well in, this time outpacing the 14900K by a 12% margin. This is also another example where the performance and extreme profiles deliver similar results. So limiting the power of the 14900K, it's not really an issue here. The Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart performance is very competitive, though we are seeing a hit to the 1% lows of the 14900K when using the performance profile, 6% at 1080p for example. Overall though, the 14900K and 7800X3D are very comparable in this title. Finally, we're going to look at Starfield, and this one plays slightly better on the 14900K, at least when looking at the average frame rate. Interestingly, the 7800X3D is able to slightly nudge ahead for the 1% lows, but I think it is fair to say that overall the experience is very similar. Okay, so here's a look at the average performance seen across the 24 games tested. The 7800X3D was an average 6% faster than the 14900K when running the Extreme Profile on the Core i9 processor. So that's a fairly typical margin that we've come to expect when testing a wide range of games. Now, if you were to limit the 14900K to Intel's performance profile, the 7800X3D would be 9% faster on average, or 11% faster when looking at the 1% lows. This also means that on average we saw just a 3% difference between the performance and extreme profiles across our testing. Of course there were examples where the margin was much greater than this, 
but there are also plenty of examples where the margin was next to nothing. So running the performance profile won't likely result in a noticeable performance decline when gaming, which I suppose is great, but realistically there's no reason not to use the advertised extreme profile that Intel has used previously for all of their in-house benchmarking. As we just saw, the 7800X 3D was 6% faster on average across the 24 games tested, and here's a look at the margins across those games. As usual, the biggest win for the Ryzen processor came in ACC, where it was 33% faster. But we also saw big wins in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, Baldur's Gate 3, A Plague Tale Requiem, Hogwarts Legacy, and Counter-Strike 2. What we didn't see was a single example where the 7800X 3D was slow up by more than a 5% margin, meaning the worst results for AMD were seen when testing in Starfield, Ghost of Tsushima, and Dragon's Dogma 2. Now, when running the 14900K using the performance mode, the 7800X 3D was worst case, just 2% slower. So in other words, when the Ryzen processor does lose, the performance ends up being about the same. Finally, here's a look at the 14900K running the extreme profile compared to the performance profile. On average, it was just 3% faster using the higher power extreme mode, with the biggest margin reaching 7% in Homeworld 3, which is probably the most CPU demanding game here. For the most part though, we were only looking at a difference of a few percent. Now one of the biggest advantages of the 125 watt performance profile is of course power consumption, and although still miles worse than the 7800X 3D, it is a noteworthy improvement. For example, in Starfield the 14900K delivered similar FPS performance using either profile, but the performance profile reduced total system usage by a massive 15%, shaving 100 watts off the system usage. And that's still a 25% increase over the 7800X 3D for similar FPS performance, but still, it's a great efficiency improvement here for gaming. That said, the improvements will vary from game to game, and in Assassin's Creed Mirage, we're only looking at a 6% reduction in power usage, which is a lot less impressive given that the average frame rate also dropped by 4% and the 1% lows by 10%. Then we see a 12% reduction in The Last of Us Part 1, which is nice, though that's still 25% more power than what the 7800X 3D used for a similar level of performance. Looking at a few more games, we saw an 8% reduction in power usage for the 14900K with the performance profile in Cyberpunk 2077, and that meant it still used 18% more power than the 7800X 3D, which isn't great for Intel given the 3D V-Cache part was 15% faster. The 14900K saw its power usage reduced by 12% down to 485 watts for the entire system in Spider-Man, which again is nice, but it's still a 35% increase from what we see with the 7800X 3D, and that particular part averaged just 358 watts. Finally, when testing with Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, the power usage was extreme for either profile, that is either Intel profile. Switching to the performance mode only reduced total system usage by 4%, and overall we did see a similar level of FPS performance. And sadly, this does mean even with the performance profile, the total system usage is 43% higher than that of the 7800X 3D. So there you have it. For gaming, not a lot has changed really, which isn't that surprising given that Intel has always tested their 12th, 13th, and 14th gen CPUs, using what we now call the extreme profile. So PL1 equals PL2 at 253 watts. A power consumption at 253 watts is still, it's high. Extreme you could say, because you know the CPU is sucking down 253 watts and that is a lot of power for a desktop CPU and certainly much more than the 7800X 3D as we just saw in our power testing. Although the performance mode did dial back power consumption by a reasonable margin for only a very small performance decrease, the end result still wasn't great, especially relative to what we saw from the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D. Having the ability to load a more power efficient 125 watt profile for the 14900K is kind of nice, but I'm also not sure why Intel has this specification for these flagship k skew parts. After all, if you want a more efficient processor, just by the non-K models, it'll save you a fair chunk of change as well. This does cause us to question Intel's intentions here, and having recently spoken with multiple engineers from Intel's board partners, we have speculated that Intel's using the performance profile to dodge any potential RMA requests from customers. 
We've been told in no uncertain terms that some Intel Core i9 processors that have been running without power and safety limits have suffered silicon degradation, and this is the reason why many of them have started to run into stability issues using even the extreme profile. And there have been many online reports of just that. So for Intel, having the ability to tell those users that they must run the performance profile to solve their stability issues is a nice get out of jail free card. And while we're yet to have any evidence that this is going on, it seems like the most plausible explanation for why Intel's now mandating their partners include the performance profile on all LGA 1700 motherboards. Regardless of what we think might be going on, the performance profile need not exist for unlocked Z series motherboards using unlocked k skew processors. The minimum configuration here should be the one Intel advertises, so PL1 equals PL2 at 253 watts. Anything short of that is completely unacceptable. As for how all this new information changes our past reviews and recommendations, it doesn't. Gaming performance isn't significantly different to what we've shown in the past, nor is power efficiency, and we still believe the 7800X 3D is the better overall gaming CPU, especially in terms of value given it costs just $340 US right now, Pretty great bargain, that. The 14900K, on the other hand, that costs considerably more at $550 US. And while it is a much better productivity CPU, if that's what you're after, the 7950X 3D might be worth considering, given it's recently dropped down to just $500 US. The point is, we never really recommended the 14900K or even the 13900K to gamers. They just cost too much. They use way too much power. And as a result, they do run very hot. And of course, the LGA 1700 platform, it has no future. Look, they're by no means bad gaming CPUs, so just want to stress that point. In fact, in terms of gaming performance, they're actually really good. But with a part such as the 7800X 3D costing much less, and it is typically a bit faster, the choice has always been pretty obvious. AMD has also just announced extended AM5 support to 2027 plus. So that is great news for those of you who have already invested in the platform. Finally, if you've just purchased a Core i9 processor, or you've been running one for some time without an issue, just make sure you're using the new Extreme Profile and you should be right moving forward. If you have been suffering stability issues and the Extreme Profile is still unstable, then you really should be seeking a replacement CPU, as running at the Performance Profile is unacceptable. And that is going to do it for this video. If you liked it, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content. And if you want some more Harbour Unbox goodness, we do a float plane or Patreon. Signing up to either one of those gives you access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, behind the scenes content, and some Q&A stuff. So check that out if you're interested, but if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.